Uh, this is just to show the importance and the efficacy of uh, the mechanical support devices uh, in a chip patient who underwent uh, complex PTCA. The patient was a 75-year-old male, non-diabetic hypertensive. He had a previous CVA and has recovered partially from left hemiparesis. He had history of twice pulmonary edema in the last one year. Uh, now again he was admitted with chest pain and pulmonary edema. His hemoglobin was 13 grams, he was tachycardic, and BP was borderline 90 by 60, GFR was 60. ECG showed complete LBBB. Echo showed severe LV dysfunction, global hypopenesia, EF of 25%, BNP was high, troponin was positive, lactates were in increased 5.5. Patient was stabilized for two, three days and uh, we took him for coronary angiogram. And this was the echocardiogram. You can see dilated LV with global hypokinesia, severe LV dysfunction. This was the angiogram, uh, non-dominant RCA with some disease in the proximal segment. And the, there was a tight distal left main uh, stenosis uh, with osteal circumflex involvement. And uh, both left main LAD and uh, circumflex were severely calcified even in the angiogram itself. Uh, there was another uh, st stenosis calcified lesion in the mid LAD also. And uh, as we can see, the osteal circumflex also was tightly stenosed and there was calcium uh, visibly on the angiogram itself. So it was a triple vessel disease with severely calcified uh, uh, lesions in the left main LAD and LCX with a non-dominant RCA, patient was in uh, uh, severe LV dysfunction. Patient developed pulmonary edema immediately after the angiogram, it's on the table. So we had to shift him out and stabilize him, and uh, we took him for PTCA after four days. On the day of uh, PTCA, blood pressure was 80 by 30 only, and uh, we had put a PA catheter which showed a PA pressure of 29 by 10 with a mean of 15. Uh, because he was a uh, sick patient with uh, multiple comorbid morbidities and he developed pulmonary edema immediately after the angiogram previously and uh, severe LV dysfunction, severe calcified lesions, we thought he will benefit from uh, an MCS and uh, he could afford ECMO only. So we had placed a VA ECMO for him using a 19 French uh, sheath in the arterial side and a 22 French sheath in the venous side. And uh, after the ECMO, his blood pressure improved, but his PA pressure also improved, I mean increased, sorry. PA pressure also increased to 40 per 11 with a mean of 19. This was probably because of the increase in the LV after load uh, and an increase in the LV EDP because uh, as, as we have seen from the previous talks yesterday and today, uh, ECMO increases the LV after load because there is a retrograde flow in the iota. So various decompression methods were uh, proposed. Of, the, of that, uh, atrial septostomy is one, surgically placed LV vent is one, which is really not possible in many places. Impala will be very useful, but this patient couldn't afford. And what was easily available and cost effective was the IABP. So we used, we, put, we had put an IABP also for him following the introduction of ECMO. And uh, with that, uh, he stabilized a bit. And we proceeded with PTCA and uh, we crossed the lesion with a wire, but unfortunately, the balloon could not cross the lesion in the mid LAD. As we can see, there is a chunk of calcium in the mid LAD also. The balloon couldn't cross. After that, we tried to pass a microcatheter. Microcatheter also wouldn't cross. We can see that guiding catheter was backing out when we tried to push the microcatheter. Uh, we kept the microcatheter as distal as possible in the calcified lesion and removed this wire. And uh, obviously, we had to put a, uh, we had to do a rotablation. We exchanged the wire to rota floppy, and we did rotablation with 1.5 bar uh, at uh, 160,000 RPM. After four or five atoms, we could cross the uh, 
lesion in the medial lady and we could do a lot ablation in the proximal lady also. Unfortunately, after that, the patient developed a severe uh, slow flow or uh, no flow in the LAD. But luckily, we could uh, manage it with the uh, intracoronary cocktail and other uh, medications. And after that, uh, we did an OCT for this. And uh, OCT, as we can see, this is the distal uh, landing zone. And uh, there was 360 degree circumferential calcium in the LAD. And uh, there were multiple cuts in the calcium also following the rotablation. So that uh, implies that the stent expansion will be good. And uh, calcium was sup sup I mean superficial and uh, circumferential and thick calcium. This was the osteal LAD part and this was the uh, LMCA part. And we did an OCT from the OC LCX side also. And uh, there was some calcified lesion in the proximal LAD. And uh, we proceeded with a, we were confident because we, we have uh, ECMO, we have IABP, we are, he was on inotropes and uh, uh, good anesthetists were there. We proceeded with a DK crush uh, technique for the PTCA to LM, LAD, LCX. Uh, usual DK crush uh, technique, we uh, placed a stent in the LAD and crushed it from a balloon from the LCX and did uh, cr cross the wires and uh, did one balloon, a kissing balloon, then a part, and then again stent from LMC, LMCA to LCX. Again, wires were crossed and uh, usual DK crush stuff. And this was the OCT following that, as we can see that uh, uh, the LM, LAD LCX bifurcation area is well open and uh, stents were well open. After that, we did a IVS valuation for the LM part alone. Um, because we were, we were not very sure whether the OCT will be useful in osteal LMCA stenting. We did an LMCA IVAS evaluation and it showed a good uh, expansion and uh, good uh, opposition. This was the angiogram, final angiogram. We can see the LAD flow is very brisk and the circumflex is uh, nicely open. So to conclude, and this was a very complex case, chip case with multiple comorbidity, morbidities, severe LV dysfunction, and uh, with a recurrent pulmonary edema, even after the angiogram, we had a pulmonary edema. With severely calcified LMCA bifurcation disease, we had to use rotablation, cutting balloon, we had to encounter slow flow and manage it, and uh, we did a DK crest stenting, which took some time, and uh, we have done OCT imaging and IOS imaging. All these things were possible only because of the support from the MCS. And here we have used uh, two MCS uh, mechanisms like an ECMO plus an IABP. I think uh, uh, this uh, procedure was possible only because of the uh, help from the MCS. Thank you for the organizers. Thank you for my teacher, Dr. Anil Kumar. Thank you for my friends, Deepak and uh, Raj Shegal for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Really uh, complex case, really high risk case, uh, uh, two types of uh, MCS used. He would have doubt, doubt to have a, an impella, but uh, it, he did not have it. But you manage it very well. Too, All much, done. too much difference but, in the cost, sir. Pardon? <laughs> cost is too much. Yeah, yeah. There is yeah. A still, vast disparity. Still came out with a very good uh, success and uh, uh, result. Let us give a big clap to him. Should, I am sure it would have been a, 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 the best case for many, many of the August uh, performers here. Uh, any more comments, uh, Dr. Deepak? Uh, Sampath, it was an awesome case. Now, could you uh, tell the sequ sequence of events? You had the right groin uh, punctured, you had the venous cannula, you had the arterial cannula in the right groin, then you had the uh, left groin punctured. balloon pump in the left groin. Yes. Seven French guide catheter through the radial, or radial. was it six French? Seven. Seven French catheter. Yes. And you initiated off the ECMO before you started the PCA, or did you correct, have an auto correct. run? First, first you started off. You started off. So then we knew you, you, had, need you had an increase in afterload, you had an increase in PA pressure. Usually we tend to see that the PA pressure falls because of the sucking of blood from the right, right atrium through the impella yeah. venous cannula. Probably you would have given blood as well as fluids also. So that the uh, uh, outflow uh, in, uh, inflow to the ECMO is better. So probably that also could have contributed to the increase pre PA pressure. But otherwise, mostly we tend to see that it drops 
you know, immediately you start off the circulation, that's what you see. And then uh, once the procedure was over, it's a, it's a very clear cut case that in, uh, despite, uh, if at all you hadn't used an MCS, probably he would have crashed on the table with severe LV dysfunction, slow flow in LED, probably he would have crashed. It's an ideal case for an MCS. And then how, how exactly did you wean him off IABP and ECMO? Yeah. Did you on the table do a surgical removal of the right groin and then an IABP later? What was the sequence like? See, see the initially itself ECMO, we put it through the arteriotomy only because the uh, percutaneous catheters were not available that time in our hospital. So the surgeons were there already and uh, they did an arteriotomy, gave us the, the access and we had, we had put an ECMO. So the ECMO was removed on the table itself once the patient was uh, stabilized. And uh, IABP we removed after two, three days. This uh, rise in LVEDP, rise in, um, I mean, the after load, after an ECMO is a known, I, I won't say complication, it's, it's a known a big phenomenon. Menace. It's a big menace. You, yes. you, you have pulmonary, huge pulmonary congestion. IABP may not really work. We had one situations wherein uh, the surgeon had to open, open up the pulmonary, when they had to go through the SVC, open up the pulmonary vein and then went from the left atrium. They had yeah, to went, vent out went. the left atrial pressures. That's what atrial septostomy is one uh, <laughs> procedure which... Impella would be the reasonable option because IABP may not really help us in venting out the left ventricle. Yeah, but it does reduce the afterload. And uh, especially after ECMO, if there is a rise in uh, LV afterload, IABP may be useful because, yes, combination of... Uh, uh, ECMO plus Impala, ECMO plus IABP, all that have been uh, shown in uh, many uh, case studies. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a very good case. I just want to know, how did the ECMO actually help you? Impala, I can understand. It would have helped you phenomenally well, but it's too expensive. Uh, just an IABP, uh, why did you have to go for the ECMO and how did that help you? So the ECMO improves the... Uh, uh, Pressures improves the circulation to the uh, vital organs because the patient was already having hypotension and uh, uh, all that evidence of hypoperfusion was there because of the raised lactates and uh, the presence of pulmonary edema. So the ECMO, by increasing the perfusion to the vital organs, that was the use of that ECMO in this case. and. Uh, that too, the pro prolonged cardiac arrest was inevitable, almost that was going to happen and uh, probably in those particular situations, you cannot immediately push in, push in an ECMO catheter and start off ECMO. It takes at least five minutes, even, even if it's done percutaneously. So I thought probably severe LV dysfunction, planning for rota, LVBB, uh, or a very complex PCA to the bifurcation, probably you need something. Impella would have been the best option, but then uh, non lack of availability, probably ECMO would have been a reasonable bet. Sir, Ajit, sir. Uh, uh, we've been seeing all these cases with LV dysfunction going on. Uh, we are doing some great job with protection. We are doing support. But one thing we have to understand, and this is published yesterday in the NEGM, that PCI versus medical management in LV dysfunction, no difference in mortality at one year. So simply we have to look at this a little carefully and sudden cardiac death is something we are not talking here. Whether most of these patients who are low EF should get an ICD ultimately before going home is something we need to, this is any NEGM yesterday published, the revised BCIS trial, no difference in medical treatment versus PCI in LV dysfunction patients at one year mortality. So, I think there's something we need to be very careful. Now we, you know, we're doing all these complicated structural entaver and LV dysfunction. Anybody who has low function, I'm putting the ICD before going. Sir, home. sir, the same point I wanted to make prior to Dr. Rajesh's presentation. Would you prefer putting in an ICD yeah. prior to the procedure? Because once you're done with the intervention, you are committed to dual antiplatelet therapy. Rajesh mentioned that after that uh, Impella case, three days later they put in an ICD. So, what is your thoughts on that? Prior no. to the procedure, would you prefer putting in an uh, no, ICD? No, I would do it after, but I would before leaving. We had a couple of 
unfortunate deaths uh, in one month after perfect procedure on a, you would temporarily uh, stop the apt for icd no i I'm no. okay we get we we do the uh, this thing on aspirin on ticagrelor i know no people uh, no these patients whom are there will be dysfunction if they are on aspirin and ticagrelor i just hold ticagrelor for a day but i continue aspirin and fix the icd and restart the restart i think we should be worrying about this uh, Thank Deepu. you, sir. It's a wonderful yeah, presentation. Please. Sir, how often you do perfusion scan before doing such? Yeah. Uh, this patient, we had done a spectral uh, tracking of the, I mean, we did an echo and uh, there was evidence of uh, viability in almost all the areas, that's why. But uh, perfusion scan, yes, to, especially if there is uh, uh, no uh, history of uh, MI and uh, if uh, the patient presented with uh, uh, angina and the troponin was positive, then probably there is an indication that uh, it's all uh, uh, ischemic and uh, we may go ahead directly. But if it is a post-MA situation, probably we can take a call on perfusion scanning and uh, see whether that area is viable and uh, whether you should do that or not. In this case, there was evidence of ischemia uh, initially itself. And sir, how was the improvement in LV function in follow-up? Yeah, that's what I wanted to say, Deepak. Many times we have seen after the uh, revascularization, the EF improves, isn't it? Mm? And uh, the patient uh, may not recover an ICD after the uh, procedure. I've seen people who have become totally normal EF also after the uh, LMCA stenting or triple vessel stenting. And all. So uh, putting an ICD prior to the procedure itself sometimes may, may not be warranted. So this patient EF improved a bit from 25, became 35, that's all. Can we have Dr. Rasam's last comment before we close the session? Uh, you can comment on ICDs. Uh, comment, um, ICDs we usually don't put uh, uh, before the procedure. Uh, after CHIP, we wait at least uh, three months and reassess the situation. If, if it was uh, indicated before. Quite commonly, it won't be necessary. 